from Microbe TV. This is Office Hours for Wednesday, September 20, 2023. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and welcome to your viral corner of the internet. This is Office Hours, which is, you know, it's it's based on my office hours in my virology course where students come to my office. They actually do it virtually now because they found that easier and ask questions. And I thought I would open it up to the world. So welcome, everyone. I want to thank our moderators here tonight, Les and Tom and Vanity Nutrition uh, and Steph and Andrew and Frank. I think I got everybody. Everybody's here tonight. The whole gang is here. And thanks all of you for coming back another time. It's just me tonight. So, you know, full disclosure, it's just me. There's nobody else here. It's totally quiet. No guests. And so, as I like to say, you have my full attention for up to two hours. You can ask me anything you want. I'll see if I know the answer. If I don't, I'll write it down in my field notes and I'll try and find it for you. Yeah, PDK isn't here, but you know, he's starting uh, undergraduate, so he's probably a little busy because they've just started recently. I have a couple of things uh, to tell you before we start. Kind of warm up the crowd, right? <laughs> warm you up, get your questions going. And the first is you might have seen this photo that I accidentally put up, <laughs> and here it is. <laughs> oh, it's me in a cape with viruses attached to it, and I even let them strap a virus to my head. Look at that. What I won't do for viruses. So this is all about a new promotion we're going to do. Uh, we're going to be selling spike t-shirts again. So ideally, I should have brought a spike t-shirt to the incubator today. You just took this today and um, worn it. But we're going to sell spike t-shirts for Halloween. And so I'm going to uh, use this photo as, as a promotion. I'm going to try and get some of the other um, TWIF hosts and so forth to do it. So there you go. Karen, my assistant hung some viruses on the cape and she made a, it so that the coronavirus could sit on my head without falling off. So there you go. Uh, am I, am I, are you seeing that? I, I'm not seeing it on the stream. Maybe there's a big delay, huh? But it is supposed to be a, um, all I see is the, is the uh, opening screen. That's weird, right? Should be the stream. You guys seeing me? Let me see myself. Someone tell me if you see me. Give me give me a message in the chat. Cuz all I see is uh is uh the office hours thing. I'm seeing you. Okay. And you saw my silly photo. Very good. I don't know what's going on with the stream over there, but it's good. Super virus man. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> So uh, uh, PDK is on his other account. He's he's flying. So that's where he is. And um, welcome, Mark Martin. <clears throat> okay, a lot of good questions coming up. So I'm going to – what else did I want to do? There was the picture of me in the cape, right? Oh, one more thing. So <laughs> you may have seen I released a, um a episode of Beyond the Noise – I don't know when I released it, sometime this week. And um, I used this picture because I, 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 you know, I searched for interesting thumbnails and, and I found this. And it turns out it's fake. They photoshopped a picture of a baby to look like it has measles. And, you know, maybe it's not the right rash pattern or anyway. But look, it's getting people's attention. So... Um, you know, someone wrote me and told me this today, and then they said I stole it. Well, <laughs> you know, here's how I view this. If if you put a picture on the Internet, 
I, I can take it, especially if I'm not going to get money from it. But if you want to make money, you should put a note on it saying, hey, if you want to use this, you should pay us. And because I've paid to use images before, you know, that the image of the chicken with the face mask for our H5N1 episode, I paid for it. I'm happy to pay. But this is there for the taking. And yeah, I know you're not supposed to do that. But neither do we make money. I don't charge for anything, right? We don't monetize. We don't do ads. So tit for tat. There you go. Anyway, that's that's interesting. I'm going to leave it there until someone yells at me further. Right? So the heck with that. So that's, that's another thing I wanted to tell you. What else did I want to tell you? I showed you the picture. I wanted to show you... Oh, th this will... Um, I'll get some comments here, maybe. I don't know. She's... Uh, this is not what I wanted to do. Where's the, uh, where's the Amy papers? Um, microbe. TV slash the Amy papers. Nope. Where is it? The Amy papers. Come on. Here it is. I do a Google search and it comes up. Uh, all right, so nobody's seeing this, but let me screen share it. So the first one is, does everyone need a yearly COVID booster? So we just recorded this um, yesterday, and, and I'll probably put it up Saturday. So this is this is pull off its take on whether you need this new, it, they're not calling it a booster, they're calling it a vaccine, <clears throat> the new vaccine campaign. You know, it's a XB, all right, stop, <clears throat> XB, XB.1.5, something like that. And um, the, the CDC says everyone should get it, right? They recommend it for everyone over six months of age. And Paul is, doesn't agree with that because he says um, that most people, unless you're over a certain age and you have comorbidities, are going to be fine with three ancestral vaccines, especially if you've gotten infected. So we talked about this. And he's being criticized. For example, Tony Fauci said, you know, basically I agree with you, Paul, but I think we need to present a unified message to the American public. So listen to this. Catherine Wu interviews Tony Fauci and Paul Offit. Fauci says to her, Offit's right scientifically, but we need to present a unified view. Okay, so that's a public health decision, but she doesn't mention that in the article. Not nice, okay? She should have mentioned it because it makes Paul look like you know, he, he's an outlier, which he's not. And anyway, that's his view. And you now he, he writes here, the United States is now an outlier, right? Health officials in the UK, Sweden, Germany, Norway, Finland, and WHO recommend booster dosing only for those at risk, at highest risk. Regarding vaccinating healthy young people, WHO stated, although additional boosters are safe, we do not routinely recommend them given the comparatively low public health return. That's the key, the comparatively low public health return. Now, many people have asked, well, what about long COVID? And I asked Paul that yesterday, and you can see what his answer is. But the problem with long COVID is that there aren't really good studies because the disease definition is heterogeneous. And, you know, if you want to know, for example, that if a fifth dose of vaccine will help, it's a hard study to do. But what Paul said was, if you're an unvaccinated, you have a very high chance of getting long COVID. If you have one vaccine, it goes down. I don't remember his numbers. If you have two doses, it goes down. But the third dose, it doesn't really go down much anymore. So the implication is that this dose, which could be the fourth or the fifth for uh, people, depending on what they've had before, might not do anything. Now, that's speculation, of course. We just don't know. But he said, basically, I don't think you need it. I'm not going to get it. But if you want it, you can get it because everyone is, is it's open to everyone. And if you don't want to get long COVID, you can take it. If you don't want to get any kind of COVID or just mild COVID, it'll protect, it'll give you a mild disease. Take it. So that's the story there, and um, that's it. That's what I wanted to tell you. Now, we have a bunch of questions here, so I think I will jump in on those. Let's see. I told you our, um, our moderators here tonight, and we have uh, the usual suspects from 
all over the place. Uh, we have Noir from Santa Fe. We have Lise normally from uh, Ohio, but she's coming to the incubator tomorrow, so um, she might be in New York already. Rima, hello. Let's see who else is here. John, who, who's, I believe, from Minnesota. You know, I'm starting to learn where people are from. Martha, South Carolina, can still swim, eh? That's cool. Will is in China, in uh, Changsha, which I'm going to. And um, I'll be there, I think, three, four nights. And I'm doing a seminar at the university. I'll let you know um, where and when. Who else is here? Who would, uh, we, so, of course, our moderators, of which Andrew is in New Zealand, which is always very impressive. Peter is, is in the Boston area. That's cool. Kang is from Chicago. Let's see who else we have here. Pete is from the UK, right? And uh, Tom, I don't know, he's on the Oregon coast tonight picking apples before the bears get there <laughs> and break the tree. Jessica's from the University of Toledo. Uh, MK is from Eastern Massachusetts. Tom Ball, Texas. You know, I'm, I'm really remembering these from previous episodes. North of England for Cherry. Joseph is from Ontario. All right, you want to do a poll at about an hour, uh, a poll of who's been infected recently. What uh, What is recently, like the last month? Okay, I'll do that. Let me write it down. So right now it's 8, 12. So let's do it at 9 p.m. I write it down. Do a poll on who's been infected. Uh, Hannah is from Utah. Utah, where I tried to go two weeks ago. I was going to go to Salt Lake City and do a twiv, and it got canceled. Oh, my gosh. Here's Peak, halfway to L.A., up in the air, I suppose. Chicago land, Doreen, uh, New Zealand. <laughs> Markle is on the east end of Long Island. Corley from New South Wales. Corley, I'm going to be in Australia twice next year. Can have some kind of meetup, right? Nicola from Italy. Welcome. Hello, Mark Martin. How's it going? Mark is doing killer with that new podcast, Matters Microbial. I, I don't even know the names of my own podcast anymore, right? Matters Microbial. There it is. It's doing well. I like your guests. You're getting... Getting used to it, you know. It takes a while, right? Who else do we have here? Now in Atlanta, but from New South Wales. Cool. And I, there are questions here. I'm gonna I'm gonna answer them. You know, my I have this little laptop next to me that shows the stream and its health and so forth, and it's still showing the original um what do you call it? <laughs> the original thumbnail that I opened with. So let me refresh the page. Uh, what is it? Live streaming. Yeah. And see if I'm I'm there. Just, you know, my own producer here. Yeah. There, well, I see the chat. Oh, there I am. Very good. So that did it. When in doubt. When in doubt, either reboot or replug it or unplug it and plug it. Oh, Rach, you like the old picture of me that was posted online? Yeah, that was an Instagram, right? Let's see if we can uh, bring it here. Instagram. Uh, Kidoki, there it is. Yeah. Well, this is... Um, here we go. That's it. So the, the, the occasion for this is... Um, this September marks 41 years <laughs> since I went to Columbia. In 1982, I went to Columbia University as a new assistant professor. Oh, my God, what I didn't know. I knew nothing. Holy crap, I just was so naive. Anyway, I started my lab. 
But this is before that. This is 1977. So this is five years before. I was a PhD student in uh, Peter Belazzi's lab. So I was 77. I was 24, I guess, because in 73 it would be 20. And uh, four, 24, yeah. Oh, my gosh. Youth. What do they say? Youth. That's from the movie uh, My Cousin Vinny. Youth. What do you mean, youth? <laughs> ay, ay, ay. So uh, I've just gone through here to see where everyone is from. And then, then we will start up. Here we go. Jill is from Minnesota. And, you know, you guys can get the vaccine. I'm just telling you what Paul thinks. But Paul's not wrong. You can do what you want. But dang it, Portland, Oregon. Portland, Oregon. Miami. Burundi. Wow, I think. Well, you were here last week. I didn't know you were from Burundi. Huh. UK. You're hop, skipping a jump across the river. Yeah, I know you're in the area. It's cool. Come to the incubator sometime. Richmond, Virginia, Dodgerland. What's Dodgerland? Is that like L.A.? Toronto, Ontario. Winona, Minnesota. India. Whoa. Welcome from India. Lake Superior, Duluth, Minnesota. I just love where people are from. Cape Cod, Massachusetts. Trinidad and Tobago. Welcome. Very cool. Jan is in the Outer Banks, North Carolina. Mike and Lori are in Seattle, Washington. There you go. Lisa arrived in New York City. Going to the incubator to, tomorrow to say hello to Vincent. That would be me. That would be me. Garth is in New Zealand. Cheryl Santa Rosa. <laughs> Sivan was just listening to Matters Microbial Number 7 from Mark Martin, who's here on the stream tonight. Singapore. Hey, good to see you. I was there. Les likes the Blue Soup episode. Lehigh Valley, California. I'm sorry. <laughs> Lehigh Valley, Pennsylvania. Lehigh Valley, Pennsylvania. Madison, Georgia. And hello, Kip and Laura, here in San Francisco, hospitalizations are up a bit, but zero COVID deaths so far this month. Thank you for your support of science communication at microbe.tv. What else do we have here? I, I, uh, Turkey. Oh, interesting. Turkey. I love how Turkey is spelled the right, in the right language. That's so cool. Mm, Brooklyn. You're Brooklyn. Excellent. Not too far from me. SoCal. <laughs> South Florida. Albany, New York. Fayetteville, Arkansas. All right. There we go. Let's go to the top and answer some of your questions, which is always, you know, I never, I rarely get through them. I shouldn't say never because sometimes I do get through them. <clears throat> I love your questions. They're always challenging and it's just like questions from students. They're always challenging and make me use uh, my head. So let's see, where is the first one? So this is just an interesting observation from Patricia. Some say how you react to the vax is how you react to the disease. In my case, with the addition of congestion, this was true. So some people it is, for some people it's no, I had not. I had no reaction to the vaccine whatsoever, all three doses. But I, when I got infected, I knew it. I had, what did I, have? I had a lot of nasal congestion. And I didn't feel good. But, you know, I took Paxlovid on day two, and that was the end of that. But no reactions to the vaccine. No reactions to Shingrix. You got two Shingrixes. You know how many people say it knocks you out? Nothing. So I don't know what that means. I don't react to vaccines, but I'm somewhat protected, right? Because I'm still here. 
Uh, there was a question here that I wanted to... Okay, here this could be it's getting ready for my mother's 100th birthday, a small family gathering. Standard message from the king is organized, although the application form still says the queen. Oh, I thought you were going to ask a question about protecting her. But not. That's okay. Uh, here we go. Dr. Victoria, immune52, said that ipsilateral vaccination booster was preferable. A um, study on Twitter with Dr. Griffin said no difference. Both right. Sorry for asking last week. Oops, no problem. So, yeah, the the study that... So so I don't know what Victoria was... Gabriel was referring to. You know, I don't know if it was a human study or a mouse study. But the human study that Daniel quoted showed a difference. It was slightly better when you did the booster in the same arm, but he thought it wasn't clinically relevant. So what does that mean? Well, you can you can measure antibody titers, right? If you take people who get the same the vaccine and the booster in in the same different arms or the same arm, and you measure their antibody response. And remember, people are outbred, so there's always going to be a big variation. So you need to do enough people so that you get a sense of the range for two different arms and the same arm. And so they did that, and it was different, but not much. The antibody, the neutralizing antibody titers were not that much different, which probably means it doesn't make much of a difference in terms of uh, disease prevention. So I don't think it matters. I, I, I don't, you know, and, and you could do two studies and get, I mean, Victoria said, um, didn't he say the same thing? Yeah, he said the ipsilateral is the same side, so um, but it may have been also marginally improved in that study as well. So I don't think they're, they're saying different things. Nope, not at all. Uh, it's not yet 9 o'clock, so we won't do that poll yet. <laughs> Anything new about the sequence of the NOPV derivatives that are trouble? No, no. Uh, there's, there's nothing, and, they're, you know, they're not releasing... They haven't released the sequences yet. I have asked them about it, and they said it just takes time. But, however, there is an interesting article, which is in the uh, Amy, um, the Amy papers. Okay, let me let me bring it up here. Uh, let's turn on the screen share. This is good. So this, so these are all new. Um, starting with genetic tracing of market wildlife and viruses at the epicenter. That's the preprint of the analysis. Well, let's take a look at it. That's the preprint uh, where Florence Debar had, um, you know, found uh, mitochondrial signatures from animals. And so this is the formal analysis of that. So that's cool. It's just by our archive, but it's, it's going to be published, I'm sure. But anyway, here, closing in on zero, adapting to complexity and risk on the path to end polio. So this is within 18 weeks. So there are problems. We don't have the sequences, Tom, but that got me off on bringing that in. So that's cool. Here we go. This is interesting. Well, they're all interesting, right? Any new viruses could come up from underground after earthquakes. Uh, I, don't, I don't see why not, right? Why not? You could. You could imagine. Um, let's see. Well, how, could it, how could they come up uh, in an earthquake? So the... If it happened in a permafrost where viruses are frozen, then it could upheaval, melting. If they're if they're buried animals, but they're going to have rotted away. But I think if sewers are broken and you have widespread contamination, that could spread human viruses. So, and you know the thing is, yeah, viruses can be buried, and if there's upheaval. They could come to the surface, and if their hosts around, they could infect them. So, I don't see why not. Yeah. 
Frank says, I believe you said that RSV vaccination lasts two years. <clears throat> Does that mean the antibodies are strong for two years? Yes, I do believe the antibody levels in that study, the, the, the phase trial, I think it was the phase two, three trial, they looked out for two years and the antibody levels remained high. Now, I'm not going to go searching for it now, but I could show you that figure. Because I remember when Daniel showed it on his uh, clinical update. It, it was very impressive because I'm used to graphs where the antibody titers are going down because we're looking at SARS-CoV-2 antibodies for the last couple of years, right? <clears throat> but this one remained quite high. So you have it rise, and for SARS-CoV-2 it goes down. But for this one it remained high. Excuse me. For two years, yeah. <coughs> because I don't remember what they did with T-cells. But the antibody levels were high, yeah. So that will protect you. That will give you a mild disease, presumably. We'll see. <coughs> Certainly made an impact on disease in that study, yeah. Uh, I... No, it was first brought up in an early TWIV episode, but I have forgotten. Can you explain? Ask them about going to the opera. Okay. <clears throat> so uh, what that means is, so if you, if you, <laughs> I think I know if I can even explain it. So it means that you can discern subtle things. All right. So for example, uh, in the in the TWIV, the context was this. Excuse me. The context of this was that you make a knockout mouse for a gene. Let's say you do, you have a gene and you want to know what it does, and you knock it out in the mouse, and the mouse is alive. They're thriving. There's no difference as far as you can see, but who knows if there's subtle cognitive or sensory differences? So you want to send them to the opera and see if they appreciate it. That's the idea. I, I think it was first brought up by Harold Varmus. Let's see. Who said bring the mouse to the opera? Yeah, do you think that's going to work? No. <laughs> it didn't work. But uh, there, I have a book here by Harold Varmus. <clears throat> the Art of Politics and Science. So let's see <laughs> if I can look in the, in the index right uh would they have opera <laughs> mouse okay there's no mouse in opera opera and there's no opera because i'm pretty sure uh, in this book he mentioned it but that's that's what it means so you send a mouse to the opera and maybe they don't appreciate it anymore because you don't a mouse you don't know right but the point is that you if you're just looking for a normal size and normal growth and weight and morphologically intact and so forth, that's not enough to know what that gene is doing. So you send them to the opera, you see if they appreciate the opera, if they appreciate the subtleties, if they enjoy it or if it's boring, whatever. So that's the idea. Get it? Does it make sense? Okay. <clears throat> and Rob is going to dress up as a fungus for Halloween. So I, I guess I'm dressing up as... Uh, here, I'll show it again. It's super virus. Yeah, the cape is not big enough, for, unfortunately, but that's what I have. And so, you, by the way, uh, we'll we'll start running this campaign soon, hopefully. And you can buy more sh Spike T-shirts where the profits or some part of the profits are going to go to Microbe TV. I started Paxlovid a day and a half after a positive test. How much of an immune response have I successfully mounted, if any? Because <clears throat> we get this question all the time. And I think, so I did the same. I started Paxlovid a day after a positive test. No, I, I started Paxlovid immediately, the same day as the positive test. Yeah, I took the test. I'm positive. Daniel wrote me a script and I got it the same day. Yeah. Yep. 
So I think it is reproducing. Remember, before the onset of symptoms, it is reproducing. So I, I don't know how much. I don't know how to quantify it for you. I'm, I, I think you've already been vaccinated, so what you're getting is a memory response, and then you're doing some maturation of the antibodies, presumably. And I think there's enough antigen there in those early days of reproduction to do that. And, you know, there was, I think we did a paper on TWIV some time ago where it addressed uh, this very question. And I, I think the answer was that you do get uh, adaptive responses even when you're inhibiting viral replication. I think in that case it was uh, by monoclonal antibodies. But... Um, you know, it's not, not a lot of studies are done of that, yeah. <clears throat> I think I missed Elcio from Brazil, the Amazon region. Welcome to office hours. Is anybody looking for proteins left over from a pre-RNA world? No, there weren't any proteins, right? There were, so the RNA world... There's, there's just RNA. And before the RNA world, <laughs> there's no protein. There's just chemicals, right? Sub-polymers, because the RNA is the polymer. So before the RNA world, there were no proteins. Has anyone looking for... So the question would be, are there, is anyone looking for proteins after the RNA world? And the, and the answer is no, we can't. We can't even find RNA there. It's too old. It's not, none of it's ever going to have lasted, unfortunately. So the RNA world, the existence of the RNA world is based on <clears throat> the idea that you can, well, first of all, that there are RNAs today that are catalytic, like there are RNA-based enzymes. The ribosome uh, catalysis is based on RNA. Splicing is driven by RNA. So, and by splicing, I mean RNA splicing, the breaking and joining of RNA pieces. So the, the implication is that there was once a, an RNA world where these activities existed and made the, the RNAs uh, work and reproduce and so forth. And um, so, so that's the main evidence for it. We don't have any physical evidence. There are no fossils because it's too long ago. It's, it's, it's a billion years ago to have any evidence for that. So we're not looking at <clears throat> for proteins. We're not even looking for RNA. Right? The oldest virus we have is 40,000 years old, which is pretty pathetic considering the dinosaurs. Right? We have fossils, which are much older than that, but we don't have, we don't have virus fossils now. Uh, Noir misses Amy and also Hans. Yes, I miss Amy as well. Amy was a great contributor to this stream. I'm sorry she can't participate any longer. Farhad says, can we say antivirus drugs and chemotherapy treatments are generally are similar in functionality? They both inhibit cell replication and functionalities. Well... Not really, right? They both, the, the virus, the antiviral drugs are inhibiting the virus, not the cell. There are some drugs that are antiviral, but they, they inhibit a cell protein, right? But there are not a lot of them. The first one that comes to mind is Maraviroc, which is an inhibitor of CCR5, the HIV co-receptor. So that's a drug that binds a cell protein and inhibits virus attachment. So there, there's some. There are not a lot of those. Um, so those would be drugs that inhibit the cell, and therefore by inhibiting the cell, they inhibit the virus. So a chemotherapy agent for cancer is killing the cancer cell. And, you know, you try and make it specific in some way or more specific so that it doesn't kill a lot of your own cells. But we don't, we're not always great at that. We, they do have toxicities and side effects, which are not pleasant. So the cancer drugs are killing cancer cells, but they're also sometimes killing normal cells. So those are very different from the antiviral drugs that inhibit viruses. I hope, I hope that's clear.
What is an anti-vaccine? I don't know what an anti-vaccine is, but an anti-vaxxer is someone who opposes vaccination, right? I don't know what an anti-vaccine is. Anybody know? I feel like I should know something here. Anti-vaccine. Maybe it's a typo. Someone was writing anti-vaxxer and the spell checker made it anti-vaccine. That happens a lot. <laughs> oh, dear. Please explore AI topics in TWIV. AI will be disruptive in biology, and I've seen smart, influential people say dumb things about gain of function and origins. Well, yeah, for sure. Smart people are saying dumb things about it. I, don't, I just don't, I don't get it. <clears throat> but AI, yes, I would like to find someone who can speak to it. That's the key, right? Let me write it in my book. And then I can see what the last thing. I have a bunch of, of books here. Here, uh, AI, person to talk about AI. AI specifically in biology. They don't know people in the AI world. That's the thing. And you know, I, it took me a long time to know computational virologists. You know, Eugene Coonan and Nels Eldy, maybe less Nels, but he uses the tools. But certainly Eugene and others. And maybe Eugene would know someone. That would be a good person to, to ask. So thank you for that. We will we will do that. <clears throat> Off topic, does the CDC and or manufacturers investigate the causes of side effects so that they can modify the vaccine or do they just cross their fingers after four or five iterations have mods been made? Well, the modifications to reduce side effects are typically made before you get into people. Uh, and then, you know, I can't think of a vaccine that has failed safety in people. Can anyone? What vaccine has failed human safety? I mean, there's certainly batches of vaccines that are withdrawn, like the uh, IPV made by Cutter Labs was withdrawn. <clears throat> But I, I do think that um, you don't modify any further. The, the, I mean, the COVID vaccines are a great example because they were released, you know, based on preclinical studies and, and the adjuvants really have not been changed as far as I know. And that's really what's different. You know, you have the mRNA, which is, is you know, it's mRNA and it's modified, but then the lipid nanoparticle part is, is what you could change. And as far as I know, that hasn't been changed. And, you know, it's, it's a tough one because <clears throat> people have, a, well, you have to balance side effects with immunogenicity, right? So when you take an outbred species, like well, every, pretty much everything on the planet, right, except laboratory animals, humans, they're all going to have different, a broad range of responses to whatever you do, including vaccination. They have a broad antibody response, but they also have a broad response in terms of side effects. So, you know, if you have people with no side effects like me and then people who get serious side effects, what do you do? If you change the vaccine, you may then get side effects in other people where you didn't before. So it's a tough, tough problem to address. But also... <clears throat> You don't want to affect immunogenicity. So that's that's not a thing you want to do in people. It's too expensive to do that and too too much too long term. So you do that in preclinical studies in animals, yeah. So that's that's what I think about that. Why is there no vaccine for NIPA? NIPA N I P A H one one P. Well there is actually. There's an experimental vaccine. <clears throat> And I will tell you about it. Uh, in July of 2022, well, there's, um, <clears throat> there's actually more than one. So NIH is testing an mRNA vaccine. You can guess who they're doing it with. They're doing it with Moderna. And um, it's, yeah, mRNA 1215 that was last summer. 
But I also know that CEPI is, has tested Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness and Innovation. It's a nonprofit that raises money and tests vaccines that no company wants to spend money on because there's not enough of a market. And they, it, it turned out that, <clears throat> so Hendra virus is a related m virus also found in flying foxes that causes severe disease in horses and people. And there have been a number of outbreaks in uh, Australia. And so they made a, a Hendra vaccine consisting of the spike protein of the virus, purified protein. And it, it works well in, in uh, horses to protect them. And that's the target there because you, you don't want to immunize people. The, the disease is too rare. But you immunize horses, you know, have 10 horses in a stall, you immunize them all, and then they won't infect people if they get infected. So anyway, um, it turned out that that vaccine also inhibited disease caused by Nipah virus. So it was tested by CEPI in a phase one. So let's see if we can find it. CEPI, uh, Nipah vaccine. CEPI funded project to inhibit blah, blah, blah. Hmm. So CEPI has apparently put $100 million into four uh, Nipah vaccine candidates. So right now, there is no approved vaccine. But... Um, there are a number of vaccines in progress being studied. So, it, you know, there is an outbreak in Kerala, India, as you know, and it uh, would be nice to have a vaccine. Um, let's see, 300 cases. Wow. So the current outbreak in Kerala, uh, two people have died. Six people are infected and two have died uh over 700 people have been tested for infection. So there are a lot of outbreaks in Kerala. There have been four in the past five years. And this is a, this is a hot area for outbreaks. And one of the reasons is that uh, the bats that harbor the virus are there. And interestingly, you know, this... Uh, <clears throat> what was I going to say? This... <laughs> The original outbreak of, of Nipah was in Malaysia and Singapore, and those have been uh, taken care of. So there you go. Uh, Rob wants to know if I'm worried about imprinting with the new COVID booster. So my understanding is that it's not an issue because it's substantially different from the ancestral spike that we're not going to have uh, imprinting as an issue. And also the antibodies so far induced by uh, this vaccine neutralizes all of the circulating BA as Omicron subvariants so far. So no, I, I'm not worried that they're gonna preferential, imprinting would be preferentially inducing antibodies against the ancestral. And as far as I can see, and I've seen some data on that, it's not happening. Okay, Lori asks, if an antibody is neutralizing, does that mean that the antibody alone is capable of neutralizing the virus without help from other mechanisms? For example, phagocytes or complement? Yes, that's exactly right, because you do the neutralization assay with virus and antibody alone, right? So there's no there's no complement, there's no phagocytes. So it's a purified system. And so any neutralization you get is just due to the antibodies, correct? However, it doesn't mean that it could be enhanced by phagocytes. For example, you could have the antibody virus complex bind the phagocyte via an FC receptor and get taken up and destroyed. So that could enhance clearance of the virus. Same thing with complement. The antibody virus complex could activate complement, which is a collection of serum proteins, and then the complement can lyse the virus particles too. So yes, it could, it could be enhanced, but the, the neutralization assays that we see, they are all done with purified components. So just antibody, yeah.
any hopes for utilizing viruses as a substitute for antibiotics <clears throat> within the next 10 to 20 years. So what you're talking about is phage therapy. And yes, there is, there is hope, substantial hope, I think, um, <clears throat> because there have been, well, a lot of people are working on this, and there have been some spectacular successes. It's a challenging issue, right? There are lots of problems, potential problems. I mean, you have to match the bacteriophage, the virus that's going to kill the bacteria, to the bacteria that's causing the infection. So the successes that have been seen, that's what they do. They take the isolate from the patient, they find a phage that will kill it and use that, and that takes some time. And how that fits into an FDA paradigm of, of approval, it's not clear to me. You know, I don't, it's not my area, but, you know, you make a drug and it's approved and you use it and you don't change it, but the phage is going to be different. So that's going to be a different approval period process. And also... You know, if you if you put phage on someone's skin, if you have a skin infection, that's that's a good application. But if you then if you have to inject it into them, then you have the issue of antibodies arising. Now we did a paper on TWIV. Was it TWIV? No, or was it TWIM? Recently, where they sprayed the phage, so the person had a pseudomonas infection. They sprayed the phage into the respiratory tract, and that was effective. So that's a creative way of of doing it, right? Uh, a little bit different. So I, I do think they're going to be, I don't think it's going to solve every problem. I don't think it's phage are going to be used for every infection. I think it's going to be limited, but it will be used for some. So yes, I have hope and the progress being made has hope as well. So Carol, our nephrologist says, my platelet count dropped after the primary series and the third COVID vaccines, and so I do not plan to take any more COVID vaccines. All right, so that makes sense. I wonder how, Carol, you came to check your platelet count. Did you have some symptoms that suggested to you that you would have uh, platelet drops? And, and this is coming from someone who's not a doctor. So if it's obvious, uh, just tell me. I'll be corrected, and hopefully I remember it to next time. So, Carol, if you're still here, why did you check your platelets? That's my question. But I don't blame you for not taking any more. But I wonder how, in how many people <clears throat> platelets drop. I think there was a question recently for Daniel about this as well, if, it was, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, there was a, and, and it's a, a rare side effect in people who are vaccinated, right? So you too, yep. Okay. <laughs> All right, sorry. I got a text and I had to check it out. This is, is from one of our mods and sometimes when I get a text from a mod means something's wrong. I did something wrong. <laughs> oh, here we go. Can you explain the inverse vaccines? Maybe that's what the other person meant by anti-vaccine. So now I should look it up. No. Uh, let's do anti-vaccine and autoimmunity. Inverse vaccine. Okay, I'm making progress, ENDR00T. Here's an article. Inverse vaccine shows potential to treat MS and other autoimmune diseases. All right. So, as you know... Uh, some cases of MS, multiple sclerosis, are caused by Epstein-Barr virus. And what happens is you, you're infected with Epstein-Barr virus. You make antibodies against the viral proteins, and some of those antibodies will bind your own proteins. That's an autoimmune reaction, and that causes damage. So let's see what this inverse 
vaccine is a new type of vaccine this is developed at University of Chicago the Pritzker School of Molecular Engineering that can reverse autoimmune diseases without shutting down the rest of the immune system the inverse vaccine interesting takes advantage of how the liver naturally marks molecules from broken down cells with do not attack flags to prevent autoimmune reactions uh, to cells that die by natural processes. They coupled an antigen, so an antigen that would be bound by an antibody, uh, with a molecule re resembling a fragment of an aged cell that the liver would recognize as friend rather than foe, and that stopped the autoimmune reaction. Huh. So let's see this paper. This is this could be interesting. Synthetically glycosylated antigens for the antigen specific suppression of established immune responses. Hmm. So that's what the anti vaccine is. That's a great question, ENDR. And root and root. <laughs> I'm gonna put it in uh, my my screen thingy here, so you can see it. Here we go, screen share. That's really cool. Here we go, synthetically glycosylated antigens. Okay, um, so here we show that established antigen-specific responses can be suppressed by a polymer glycosylated with N-acetylgalactosamine and conjugated to the antigen via a self-immolative linker that allows for the dissociation on endocytosis and its presentation in the immunoregulatory environment. It induces antigen tolerance in a mouse model, so it basically reverses autoimmunity. That's cool. If, if uh, I would do this on TWIV, but it's not a virus paper, so maybe immune would be interested. Thank you, Endroot, for pointing that out, and I hope my explanation was um, good. So that's an anti, what did they call it? <laughs> an inverse vaccine and maybe that's what the other listener said anti-vaccine so thank you both now together we have worked towards a solution to this and that's the way it should be no arguing no accusations you know speaking of accusations i have to tell you this story are you ready it's not a big deal but Catherine wu wrote an article about whether what's the consensus on the latest uh, SARS-CoV-2 vaccine, which has been recommended for everyone over six months, right? So first sentence is, Paul Offit is not an anti-vaxxer. Fine. And she goes on to talk about why Paul <clears throat> doesn't agree with giving the vaccine to everyone. And they talk to a cardiologist who we've mentioned before. And we don't mention this cardiologist much anymore because... Well, another one of my co-hosts here uh, is no longer here, so <laughs> that person doesn't get mentioned much. But that person, that cardiologist, said that Paul Offit was preposterous. His proposal was preposterous, which, you know, someone should tell this cardiologist, you don't use that word in science. Well, you shouldn't. You should say, I disagree for this reason. Preposterous is ridiculous. You're just trying to make, you're trying to get attention trying to get hits or tweets, retweets, whatever. It's just not a word we use in science, okay? So stop it, cardiologist, as if the cardiologist would listen to anyone. Cardiologist has his own mind, does his own thing. What is it that there's a, there's a song? Oh, you know that one with the uh, that computer that goes crazy, the, the, the Portal song, yeah. <sighs> that has... That has this in it. Where, where are the lyrics? Well, I'm not going to look for them now. That, that would be silly. But that's what I'm resonating here. Okay. Let's see what's happening here. Let's get some more questions. <clears throat> My father is 98. He has, has Alzheimer's. The facility is recommending flu, COVID, and RSV vaccines. I, I think that's absolutely appropriate, yeah. Target, target, no, no other medical conditions, but still of an age where 
any infection can be dangerous. So yes, you're going to get it, this this COVID, this new vaccine. It's going to boost antibodies, including in the respiratory tract, to a certain level that'll give you mild COVID, and hopefully. And but but your father, should he test positive, should also get Paxlovid, because he it doesn't look like he is got any other medications that would interfere with it. So, but you know that. that the doctors will deal with that. Dr. Hetelina in this week's newsletter suggested we have blanket COVID vaccines recommendations. One, bad average national access to care, and two, we don't handle nuance well. Yeah, well, that's Paul Office said he didn't agree with that. He said we're just going to confuse people. Why would, why would you give tell everyone you need it when not everyone does need it? And why would these other countries that I showed you on, on his article say you don't have to do this? What do we know that they don't know? Now, everyone's entitled to their own opinion, right? But what data led them? They, they said it's a marginal return for vaccinating everybody. That's what they say. So, um Dr. Hetelina is an epidemiologist who thinks of it from a public health standpoint. And yeah, but, but Paul Offit is not an epidemiologist. He's a vaccinologist who wants a vaccine to be useful, and we know it's useful before it's used. But, you know, we're going to get less than 50% uptake of this vaccine, I'm sure, because um, there's a mixed message already, but I don't think that matters because it. I think I, uh, oh, there are only certain people that really need it and in which it will be beneficial. Now, we could all stop. We could stop all of this arguing if the CDC would get some data on whether boosters help because they plan to do this every year forever, apparently. Match a booster to the – not a booster. It's not called a booster anymore. It's just another vaccine. This year's vaccine campaign, this year's COVID vaccine campaign, match it to the circulating strain. How do we know that works? How do we know that's worth it? You know, it's not zero cost. So let's get some data. But they're not. I guarantee you they will not generate any data that shows that. And I think that's unfortunate. I remember in 2008 recession and multiple classes were canceled. If, if we'll have another one in the next year or so, can it affect the ongoing research projects? What are you talking about, a recession or, or a pandemic? I don't think we're going to have a pandemic in another year. Pandemics are never that close together, right? And so you may say, but rack and yellow, how can you predict the future? And you'd be absolutely right. I can't predict the future. All we can do is learn from history. Remember that saying? Do you? Those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it, George Santayana, he gave that speech in 1962. Those who could not remember the past are condemned to repeat it. So that's why we say we don't have pandemics every year, different ones anyway, because we haven't seen it. But it doesn't mean it can't happen. But uh, So if you're talking about pandemics, we're not going to have one soon. If you're talking about a recession... There are other people here who can probably tell you the likelihood of us having a recession because I'm not an economist. I never liked economics. I took a class in college and I disliked it probably because the teacher wasn't very good but wasn't of interest to me. And, you know, I have I'm, – I'm the president of a nonprofit and I'm not, not really good with the economics, so I, I need to get somebody to do that for me. <laughs> uh, is the dog transferring virus to humans? If it is, it's minimal. The, um, you know, the mink were really pretty good at transferring the virus back to humans, but that's because there are thousands of mink all slumped together with a lot of people taking care of them. You know, it's a perfect situation for back and forth. 
And that's not the situation with dogs. You know, you have a dog or two in a house with a couple of people, one person or a couple of people. So I don't think those are conditions for back and forth transmission. So um, I'm not too worried about dogs, but uh, other animals and, you know, maybe deer, maybe mice, rodents. We don't know. In my humble opinion, I think each iteration of the most flourishing variants gets better at immune escape. Um, not, I'm not sure it gets better. They're they're all different, right? They are. Um, <laughs> That, you know, the the original Omicron was a big leap, and and the other some of these others have a lot of changes, but um, I'm not sure they get better. I think sometimes they do, and sometimes they don't. I don't I don't know. You can make generalizations. <laughs> I think this is funny. Someone, the Paxlovid taste was what they imagined an old old train wheel would taste like. Yeah, I think we we had this last week where. You know, someone said that, and I said, well, it's like, how would you know what earwax jelly beans taste like if you've not, or maybe you have eaten earwax. Who knows? Okay, it's 9 o'clock. Who, poll time. Thank you, tourist. <laughs> Very good. Good timing. Who has been infected with SARS-CoV-2 recently? Okay, and I don't know, recently in the past month or two? Right? Who has been infected recently? Just say yes if you have so we can get a count of people. So we have 213 people here. And just say yes. By the way, um, we have 128 likes. So please hit the like button. We'd appreciate that and get us close to 214. So um, hit the like button. Why do I want you to hit the like button? I, I, supposedly it attracts people. If if a, if a um, stream it gets a lot of likes, it will um, attract people. I don't know if that's true, but it can't hurt for you to... It's not like a booster, which may or may not hurt. It can't hurt to hit the like button, right? <laughs> I don't know if there's a YouTube uh, poll function. So... Somebody count the yeses or noes, please. Okay, I would appreciate it. Um, because I don't want to interrupt to do that. Um, let's see. Hugger says, we in the Northern Hemisphere look to the Southern Hemisphere for info on formulating the flu vaccine. But do they look to us for their flu vaccine? They do. Both ways. Yep. We have a hus uh, <laughs> a global flu surveillance program laboratories all over in the northern and southern hemisphere and we um we do that so yes you're absolutely right that's that's how it works mark martin my virology students are very interested in polydenoviruses integrated into insect development they're integrated in the wasp genome in p particular uh, these uh, parasitoid wasp polydenoviruses and they produce virus particles. And the, the virus particles are incorporated into the ova of the wasp. And when they're injected into a caterpillar host, the viruses reproduce and they express, they don't reproduce, they, they express some genes and they immunosuppress the caterpillar so that the egg will develop. And eventually the, the larva that hatches eats its way out. Right, what was that uh, alien? Alien didn't invent anything. The polydenoviruses did. I think we had someone on the show from, let's see, Polydna virus and uh, TWIV. Yeah, we could do that. Mm -hmm. I could have sworn we had a, uh, a polydenovirus person on. Wasp? Nope.
We certainly have talked about them a lot, and we've done episodes on, on papers. But yes, they're quite interesting. From TWIV. 1045, the Lassa. Control animals showed signs of disease. Are those signs most likely the result of cytokines? Well, remember, the controls are not immunized, so the virus is also reproducing. So I would guess it's most likely a mixture, right? Would, would you say because um, they're not immunized? Let's, let's look. This is worthy of looking. Yep. <laughs> Uh, where are we going here? This will just take me a minute. Twiv papers, so I have everything nicely filed away. <clears throat> Someone says, you have to teach people your, your methods because <clears throat> you're not going to be around forever. <clears throat> okay. That is a nice thing to say to someone. Okay, Elasa mRNA vaccine. <clears throat> Control animals showed uh, disease. Yeah, these are the sections. I would guess, I, I think, Lori, it's a combination of cytokine and virus reproduction, yeah. Okay, Bambi took the COVID booster on Monday. Very little reaction, fever, a few hours. Okie dokie. Thank you for your calm rationality. <laughs> we need more of that. Thank you, Carl. Um... There have been days when I'm not so calm, but I try and always be rational. So even if I get a little excited, I, st I try and keep my rationality. I mean, I, I was trained to be scientist, not a um, a science communicator, right? And so my first reaction is to look for data and use that to drive what I'm thinking about. And I, and I think a lot of people don't do that, unfortunately, and that's not right. Uh, can you have Carla Sally from the past year? We have had her on TWIV, um, and it was a really interesting episode, so you should go check that out. Let's go. Let's, let's search for that. Carla, S-A-L-E-H. You know, she was a postdoc with Raul Andino. Uh, I have to put TWIV there in the search. 301. That was at a virology meeting. The International Congress of Virology, which was in Montreal, and she and Curtis Suttle were both on the TWIV. It was really good. So I highly recommend that. TWIV 301, okay? So what do we have for... All right, I'm going to let it go. I'm going to let it go more the poll, that is. Uh, I have to say, I noticed more people wearing masks in the airports. I do. I did, too, last week, uh, to uh, just back and forth to Ithaca. And just walking around New York, there are quite a few people with masks. Yeah, there are people on the street, also people in the train station at Penn Station. Yeah, more people are wearing masks, which, no problem if you want a mask. But <coughs> I wish they would all wear it properly. Because sometimes they don't, right? With the rabies vaccine, the injection locations matter. Rabies vaccine injection locations. I'm not aware of this. They should be injected into the deltoid for adults and children over two and the anterolateral thigh for younger children. Okay, so that's the WHO guide for rabies vaccine. Can you understand? Some of us, okay, me, need the updated vax for the same reason I understand basic physics of aviation. No, I'm safe, but I'm never as relaxed in turbulence as a pilot. You can do that. That's fine. I'm, I'm just telling you me and Paul's uh, thoughts on it. We go by the science, but I understand if you want to feel safe, that's fine, absolutely. And we talked about this. Paul said, absolutely. Anybody who wants it can get it. Uh, we're just discussing the best policy, right? Uh, if you're worried about long COVID, get it. 
anything that worries you about if you don't want to get any kind of COVID, if you just want mild COVID, get it. I'm not telling you not to get it. And neither is Paul. He, we're just expressing our opinions about what we think would be the ideal situation. So, so why shouldn't everyone get it? Well, Paul always uh, says, well, who knows what side effects would happen after many, many injections. I mean, and I think that that's predicting, right? So I'm not too worried about that. But I think if a vaccine is not helpful and people find out, then that reduces confidence in vaccination. So, and I think that's in part why CDC never does studies to address whether having a, a vaccine every year it makes a difference because they just want you to believe that it does. So, no, there's no harm in you doing that. That's perfectly fine, and I don't mind at all that, that anyone, if everyone got the vaccine, that would be fine with me. I'm just saying from a scientific viewpoint, I'm not looking at a public health where you may want a harmonized message or whatever. Just scientifically, I don't see the need. But uh, it's absolutely fine for you all to get it. I need a hep A vaccine. An advisor said if a second jab is done well within a year, it gives 25-year protection. What would be the best interval? Well, I think, now not knowing the data, okay, so I'm, I'm going to kind of wing it here. I would say two months minimum. That's a good amount of time to you know, establish those initial memory B cells and then to, to get them going on somatic hypermutation and so forth. So within a year, right? I think two months is a good rule of thumb, but it, I mean, it could be special for Hep A. I'm not aware of it. I don't know the data, but I would say two months. Yeah. <laughs> Listen to Twiv 1039 and Dr. Ramsey, who does the timestamps, and holy cow, do you have to be an astrophysicist to clean up at the incubator? No, I clean up, and Karen, my assistant. No, I, I you don't have to. We have good people on, on Twitter. Yeah, I agree. Jolene is wonderful. <laughs> it's a very funny comment. I like that. <laughs> you have to be an astrophysicist to clean up. <clears throat> no, I, the other day we had um, our textbook meeting at the incubator. And uh, unfortunately, I don't have a picture of it. But the, the, we had lunch and the floor was kind of messy. And the next day was I vacuumed it. I have a PhD. That's what you need to... <laughs> <laughs> clean up at the incubator. There's a new study about hep C suggesting it's able to resolve to a chronic state due to fad capping. Chronic hep C has been a mystery ever since it was discovered. Thoughts? Yeah, so this, this came up two weeks ago, I remember. So there's a this different kind of cap on uh, hep C. Hep C mRNA was not thought to be capped. And by now it turns out it has a flavine adenine dinucleotide cap, right? And so they speculate that maybe this has something to do with uh, chronic hep C. But um, there's no proof, right? And I don't know how you would do that because there's no animal model. I mean, you can't use chimps anymore, which used to be susceptible to, to develop uh, hepatitis after infection. So... It's, it's It'll remain a speculation, I think. Save some kinds of experiments in cell culture, which might you know, suggest persistence, but not, I'm not aware of them. So I think it's more an, an issue of immune evasion and it's, you know, being able to evade immune responses and not being cleared and establishing chronic infection. Remember, it doesn't happen in everyone. It only happens in a fraction of people. So why would the cap not do that in everyone, right? So I, I'm not sure. I, I think it's unlikely and that there are immune mechanisms at play. Is Amy doing any more office hours? No, she's not doing any more, but would Brianne come back? I'm sure she would. You know, I'm really interested at what your, uh, <laughs> what your little... Um, letters there. I have a translation app, which I have to use uh, when I go to China, right? Translate. So let me see if I can translate. 
I don't know what language it is, right? It, you know, this this app doesn't... Um, let's see if this works. Uh, and you want, it says... I don't know if that's right, but maybe that's your name, right? <laughs> yeah, so Brian can come back. Um, no, variant tests are only valid for a short time. You mean why they expire? Is that what you mean? I, maybe you could clarify that. Yeah, you, the CDC schedule is six months, but you could, I'm sure you could do it in two months. It's probably just what they tested. I tested positive for COVID. They gave me La Grevo instead of Paxlovid and Molnupiravir. Still have some symptoms. Well, may, may, all right, so you're not in the hospital, so that's good. That's what, <laughs> that's what the drugs do. They have a good, they're tested for um, preventing progression to hospitalization, right? And so molnupiravir is 30% effective at preventing progression to hospitalization. So you're in that 30%. But it's not going to prevent all of your symptoms. Yeah. I did answer that, James, a while ago. So sorry it takes a while, but I'm just going through these questions here on the right. <laughs> I have non-familial hypogammaglobulinemia. So I took the new COVID. It is too early, but wife is having an operation with long recovery, so I'm going to do a lot of in and out. It sounds like a good reason, both your medical reason and going in and out of the, the hospital. Yeah, sounds good. An anti-vaxxer told me the new vaccine had only been tested on 10 mice. <laughs> no, it's not been tested on 10 mice. It's been tested on people because uh, Daniel discussed the results. So why don't we look at Daniel's paper? I know someone answered this later. You know, it's not true. But let's let's look at it. Let's go to, to Microbe TV. And I'm going to share my screen so you guys can see uh, the sausage being made here. There's nothing really special here's clinical update this is the one where he had the antibodies i believe let's see here we go safety and immunogenicity of xbb 1.1.5 containing mrna vaccines so let's see how many people they did it in uh phase two three study people participants so we had 50 people see n equals 50 who received uh, 815 and um, 51 people received 231. And so 815 is monovalent XBB1 and 231 is bivalent XBB1 and BA45. Okay. So anyway, it's not, <laughs> it's not uh, 10 mice. That's ridiculous, right? No, not 10 mice. Now, I'm not blaming you, Rich, but someone told you that. But that's what people do. They make stuff up. All you have to do is look it up. You do a simple Google search. I didn't do a Google search. I looked for TWIV. Hey, that's what you have to do. You go to TWIV and you can get your answer. I have, and Charlotte's going to Israel. I'm 80. I think it's risky physically. Well... Uh, I don't know what kind of health you're in. I'm, I'm not going to advise you because I'm not a doctor. But if I if I were 80 and I felt fine, I didn't have trouble walking, you know, I didn't need to have assistance. Well, even if you had to have assistance, people travel with that. I don't think I don't think I would have an issue with that. I want to be able to travel for many years. So I can do podcasts in remote places and, and meet listeners, right? So um, I, I'd say if you were um, 
have some issues. Yeah, but you've been here for a while on this stream, Charlotte. You're a teacher, if I, if I remember, and maybe you're retired. I don't know, but you're standing in front of a class. You're an artist. You're standing up doing that. You could probably handle it, but, you know, we don't know your medical history, so you're going to have to ask your doc what your doc thinks. recently became interested in red light near infrared is there any role for these in the virus realm no i i mean for sure uh far far uvc has a sterilizing role but let's look i don't think there's anything for that in viruses no oh, this is interesting Near-infrared spectroscopy is a promising diagnostic tool for virus infections. Yeah, near-infrared spectroscopy, non-invasive, non-destructive analysis, so being developed as a, as a diagnostic. So there you go. You said, is there any role? So you didn't ask me if it was anything specific, which is good. So there is. There's, there's diagnosis. Very cool. All right, Ian, let's see if I can do that. I don't think I can. A lot of things I just don't know the answer to. There's a gap in preventing deaths in the elderly in countries that have opened up. As in Australia, early antiviral use seems to be the greatest protector. All right, so that's great. I can handle this. If you give early antivirals to elderly who are at risk, you can save their lives for sure. So you're worried about uh, resistance. It's very interesting. We have not seen substantial resistance to uh, Paxlovid <laughs> or Remdesivir or Monopiravir for that matter. You can get resistant mutants, but they don't seem to be circulating in people. So the idea, it must be that the... Um, mutations that lead to resistance are simply making the virus less fit. So they don't reproduce well, and so they can't compete out there with viruses that don't have those mutations, which is all good news, right? So I'm not too worried about it because we've been using these for a long time now, and if resistance was going to happen, we would have seen it already. So it's a good sign. What of infection control, including ventilation? So for sure, ventilation can ha have a place in infection control, and especially in institutional settings where there are a lot of people in rooms. If you have the proper airflow, yeah, yeah it would be good. Not every place can do that, but many places have revitalized or revamped their, uh, rest, their uh, airflow and filtration, and that's made a difference. <laughs> Can you talk about the South Carolina guy who was saying that fragments of plasma DNA in the mRNA vaccine can alter the DNA in your nuclear membrane? Right. So, um, so you get an mRNA vaccine, it's injected in your muscle. And what, what uh, this person and others have found is that if you if you put that mRNA into cells, in some cases it can be copied to DNA and the DNA can integrate. So first of all, some many of those studies were not correct. They weren't done properly, but some of them were done. But they're all artificial systems using cell lines that make the enzyme that can convert mRNA to DNA. And I think I don't think they're relevant because uh, we our cells are full of mRNA, and it's not a problem. Every cell in our body has a lot of mRNA all the time, and it doesn't pose a problem. I'm sure some of it is copied into DNA, and some of it integrates. But you know, in most cells, that's not an issue if you think about it. Um, just most cells turn over very very quickly. It would only be if it integrated into a growth control gene and it messed up cell growth control, but 
I don't know of any example of that happening. So, I mean, there's certainly examples of mobile genetic elements hopping around and causing problems, um, but not of mRNAs uh, doing that. So I, do, I don't think that's an issue. And those are very rare. So you could say, okay, well, it's, it's a similar thing, rack and yellow. Yeah, it is a similar thing, but it's really, really rare. So I, I think that's, that's scaring people for no good reason, frankly, because I, I don't think that it is uh, likely to, to be any consequence. Forty-six-year-old mild immunocompromised family, unsure about booster. Doc said their system hasn't seen infection or shot for a year now, so immunity had dropped more than low COVID to worry with repeat infections. Well, you know, in immunocompromised people in general, you, they need more doses of vaccines to produce a good immune response. You know, I'm thinking of uh, studies with transplant patients where they need to get more doses than non-transplant patients to, to get it. And not everybody responds even then, but you have to give them more doses to get at least some to respond. So it doesn't sound like a bad suggestion from the doctor to, to get boosted. Team Spike Vax. <laughs> We bring our sports metaphors into medicine. It's cool. So people are taking care of Charlotte. So that's good. I'm glad to see that. That was a good phrase, way to phrase it. Was there enough antigen present before Paxlovid? Uh, I don't know if I can always phrase it better. Thank you for thinking that, though. I appreciate it. I thought about it a bit, and that's the way I would look at it. Yeah. Oh, a Halloween party at the incubator could be fun. When is Halloween? You know, I don't, I don't keep track of this stuff. September, October. It's in, it's in October, right? Halloween is the 31st. Well, unfortunately, I'm flying to Montreal <laughs> on the 31st to do a McGill visit. We can't have a party at the incubator without me, right? Um, but it's a good idea. You have a lot of good ideas that I should write down, and I don't. But maybe tomorrow we can talk about some of them. Um, maybe next year, at least. Okay, Dr. Griffin's study. Secondary boosting is more pronounced when choosing vaccine administration routes that allows for drainage by the same lymph nodes. Right. But it wasn't clinically... Daniel thinks it is not clinically significant. In other words, yeah, there, there were more antibodies when you give the boost in the same arm, but he didn't think that more antibodies would make a difference clinically. Okay. Are there any viruses that cause loss of smell? Yeah, there are several. <laughs> um, we talked about this a couple of weeks ago. Besides SARS-CoV-2 and influenza virus, let's see what the others were. And you're asking because uh, you haven't been able to smell for 20 years. Could it have something to do with growing up on a hog farm and being in the barns? My dad is the same problem. Uh, maybe. maybe. Doesn't uh, hog urine have a lot of ammonia in it? And Because maybe inhaling that ruined your nasal epithelium. Anyway, uh, rhinoviruses, coronaviruses, para-influenza viruses, Epstein-Barr virus. It's called post-viral anosmia, and there is a review article in 2021. I remember this. <laughs> I remember this article from a couple of weeks ago. Let me bring it up here. It's pretty fun. Well, not funny. You know, what scientists think are, if, is funny is most people don't think is funny. Post-viral anosmia did not begin with COVID-19. Okay. You know, a lot of um, 
people thought that COVID-19 had a lot of unique things, and it may have had some, but it also had things that we've seen before, but a lot of people didn't know this because they never thought about viruses before, and suddenly they're talking about them, and they shouldn't be like cardiologists, so that's what we get into. But yeah, but I don't know if yours was caused by an infection. I think the, the fumes from the hogs may be part of it if you're in there every day, right? <laughs> I answered your question a while ago. It takes time for me to get to it. Yeah. Roosby, thank you for your contribution. Just got the new book, Misbelief, by a behavioral economist at Duke, how, about how people are drawn to conspiracy theories or misbeliefs. Ah, you would be a fantastic guest on TWIV. All right, so let me write this down. Uh, misbelief. By Dan Ariely, Ariely, on um, conspiracies. Twiv. Okay. I will definitely uh, check it out. I'd like to read it. Right now I'm reading uh, History of the Atomic Bomb, which so far is a history of physics. It's, it's quite good, though. I like it very much. Thanks for the recommendation, and thanks for your support, by the way, of science communication. Yeah, Charlotte doesn't like the long flight, so you have to wear compression socks, socks right, which I always do on a long flight, and uh, get up a lot, walk around, drink, drink fluids. And I think you need to have some chips to give you some salt, right? <laughs> That's one of the things. Chemo often kills all rapidly dividing cells, accounting for many adverse effects. That's correct. So, you know, rapidly dividing cells include uh, the ones lining your mucosal surfaces, among others. Yeah. It was a gradual, but I can't, and now I can't even smell smoke, vinegar, nail polish, food. Can't taste much but salt. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, f tasting food is just such a big part of the pleasure of, of eating, right? I'm sorry about that. I know some people who have lost uh, the, t the sense of smell and taste. So t favorite foods like they can't eat chocolates anymore. They can't drink coffee. It's, it's too bad. It would be nice if we could fix it. I'm sorry. AI, yep. I believe there are fossil bacteria in stromatolite fossils from banded ion formations that are over a billion years old. That's correct. And we talked about that on, um, on TWIV. But there are no viruses. That's right. Yeah, the, the bacteria are just amazing. We told you, know, these... Uh, <laughs> these... these uh, these iron-fixing bacteria cause tectonic plate movements. Uh, and that started the because of the heavy deposition of iron by the bacteria that started the plates to move. Really cool story. So we, we did it on TWIM. Yeah, they're, they're, bacteria are there. They're old, but not viruses, unfortunately. Yeah. My brother uses some machine learning models for neuroscience, also my dad has used some AI and radiology studies. My dad thinks it needs some work. Hmm. <laughs> and continuing, my dad likes you a lot and turned me on to Twitter. <laughs> He's an almost retired radiologist. Well, thanks. Um, thank you, dad of New York Cohen. I'm glad you like me a lot or maybe what we talk about. Thank you. Um, Everyone likes to be li liked. Or maybe not everyone. Some people don't care if they're liked or not, right? I care if you like our work, mostly. Um, but, you know, and I, I would, will admit that if, if you like me personally, that's cool. I like that very much. All right, enough of that. <laughs> I think by anti-vaccine, they mean the, in yeah, the inverse vaccine. We went over that end route. That was a great article. Thank you so much. Really good. Thank you, John, for your contribution to science communication continued the rewatch and I feel I understand the episodes so much more Twiv 829 is the first time I remember Brienne and Vinny breaking down Paxlovid number 6 
Cool. Uh, you know, the old catalog is good. You should check it out. And we continue to crank them out. I love it. I do. I do love it. It's great. And and being here Wednesday nights reinforces it because I see you live, and you're showing what you like and what you don't like. I really enjoy that. I think a live stream is really important. Every week I have doubts about whether to continue this, but you guys are here and you make you make me think or you suggest to me that this is good. So I'm glad to do this. Failed vaccine. What about RSV from 50 years ago? Okay. Yeah, you're right. I, I mean, there were failed vaccines that, but I'm thinking of ones that had some issues and they were rejiggered and re-released. So the RSV vaccine 50 years ago, right? That failed because the vaccinated kids got more severe disease. So we didn't touch an RSV vaccine for 50 years, right? And then the first dengue vaccine, the type 2 component, uh, didn't work well. So kids were getting uh, severe dengue when they got infected naturally. So it was not recommended for people who had not been infected previously with dengue. Yeah, so those are two good examples. Thank you of uh, vaccine failures. There's, there's the, uh, the cutter incident with the polio vaccine, but that was an improper inactivation, right? But I was thinking more of the lines of, okay, we made this vaccine, we give it to people, and, and we don't like the immune response. So can we play with an adjuvant? I'm just not aware of that happening. But as you pointed out, I I miss things too. Brendan, will Michael Schmidt? I'm sure Michael Schmidt will be back, yes. Uh, give him a few weeks. I really do like um, having Michael on, yeah. By the way, if you want to donate and you don't want to use YouTube, you can use Venmo. It's up here at Microbe TV. Welcome, Viral Files. Yeah. What else do I have here? The Amy Papers. No, that's Amy Rosenfeld's email if you want to get a job. The Amy Papers. Uh, if <laughs> I didn't, I didn't know where to find it before. So she posts. I post papers that she recommends uh, on on a weekly basis. It's really cool. Thanks for the answer. We and they just cross our fingers except for some that have been identified as contraindicated for young men who have made aware of the risk. So he here's the thing. You know, the, the adenovirus vectored vaccines, were COVID vaccines, were found to cause um, blood clotting, serious blood clotting in, in a certain number of people. And so they are no longer used in the U.S., for example. And I always thought that they would go back and modify it to avoid that. And I haven't seen that happening yet. Maybe they're still working on it. But that would be a good example of you get rid of that side effect and then you can come back and use the vector, which is good. Mm -hmm. Oh, <laughs> someone has sent an email about epipharyngeal abrasion therapy. And Daniel, I asked Daniel on his clinical update last week and he said he didn't know anything about it and he would talk about it when there were some data on it but he didn't think there were any data mm. Vincent this might not be your area a lot of things are not my area but will, my insurance will not cover the new vaccine do you know if this is common that's unusual, but because it's the, making it recommended for everyone is a way to make sure that it's covered. Uh, anybody else have the similar um, experience? Anyway, someone just donated on Venvo. Thank you very much. And since I call other people out, let's let's thank them. Venmo. Peter, thank you very much for your contribution to science communication. Really appreciate it. We, um, uh, some people, uh, wh what's another example? The RSV vaccine, right? Um, 
it's not, it's supposed to, it should be covered. It's recommended for so many people over 65, but I've gotten emails from people saying, oh, it's, my insurance company won't pay for it. It's a problem. Yeah, can't, did you suspect you were susceptible to vaccine-induced thrombus? Whatever, right? V-I-T-T. <laughs> vaccine-induced immune thromb thrombotic thrombocytopenia. Good question. Oh, here is uh, Carol. I happen to have routine labs noted the drop in placements. I see. Repeated platelet count came back up. Then I decided to check my plates after the third vaccine. Again, dropped. Now back up. Okay. Routine labs. Good. Thank you very much. Did you happen to see the Lancet on BA286? Seems it had more immune escape capability. Yeah, I did, but I'm not sure if that's clinically relevant, right? The, the question is whether that will now displace others because it can establish itself in immune people. Well, we'll see. We will see. <laughs> no, I'm not going to answer that one. It was probably taken down already. What I have to eat doesn't have anything to do with... Well, first of all, I, I know things because I, I study. I've worked on viruses for 40 years, so if I didn't know anything, um, it'd be, it would not be good, right? If you spend 40 years doing something and to not be good at something, I don't think that's good. No, Tony Fauci is retired for sure. You guys have such great conversations. I don't play the horses, no. I, I I don't think I would be good at it, but I have I think I don't know how you could, you were good at playing horses, so I don't. I mostly do science communication these days. I teach, I podcast, I do I work on a textbook. That's what I do. What well, what did I miss? Where's this question I just missed here? <sighs> My son has COVID, as does 20% of his college classmates. He's okay, though. Vaccinated, mild disease in most people, yeah. I just saw a, a question I wanted to answer. There it is. It's down there. Okay. The only thing I remember from econ was the technology curve. You always got high returns out of investing in education. You also get high returns out of investing in fundamental basic research. The returns on NIH investments are huge, but we still fl fi we still are cheap when it comes to funding basic science in this company. We put it into other garbage. We say, oh, there's a big pot of money to split up, so science can only get so much. Well, the other pots are crap for the most part, not health and Oh, that's that's fine. There are a lot of pots of money that are crap, and you should put more money into research because the re ROI is great. Okay, that's that's my little talk about that. And what do we find out about the poll? I guess I'm going to get to it. Um, I'm, as I'm scrolling down here, why is it that bats seem to harbor a lot of viruses? Well, not to infect to affect humans, but just a lot of viruses, right? And then just randomly, a lot of them. Um, <clears throat> will affect humans. Why? Well, <coughs> one of the ideas is that they have a really great immune system because they have to fly, and flying generates oxygen radicals. And so you have to have a good immune system to take care of those. And so collaterally, you are pretty good at controlling virus infections. But many species have a lot of viruses in them, which is that bats have been focused on because they have given rise to a number of human outbreaks. Uh, of various sizes, and um, uh, so we, we sample them more than other animals, but I think other animals have a lot of viruses too. I think rodents have a lot of viruses, but we just don't sample them very much. Uh, I think I heard Daniel mention that inflammation was associated with increased antibodies uh, after a booster. Well, to make 
to make um, antibodies, you have to have an inflammatory response. So when, when the immune response kicks in initially, cytokines and chemokines are produced. So basically when a foreign antigen is detected, you have production of chemokines and, and cytokines, which cause increased blood flow. They cause heating and all the signs of inflammation, pain, and those lead to a good antibody response. And when you don't have those signs, which are typically made by either a virus infection or other other infections as well, but a vaccine with an adjuvant, so a non-replicating vaccine doesn't do inflammation very well, so you don't get good immune responses. That's why we put adjuvants in them, with a few exceptions. So that's what the relationship is between inflammation and antibody production and viruses that don't induce good inflammation are not cleared very effectively as a consequence. Uh, there must be a lot of COVID out there. Yeah, this is it's ramping up, but it's probably going to get even higher in the next few months, right? All right, so now we have the response. And I don't know, did someone... Uh, <sighs> Someone said, I never had COVID. Is that, how do you know? Well, COVID is a disease, all right? So if someone says, I never had COVID, it means they had no symptoms. They may have had an asymptomatic infection, but they wouldn't know that, right? Um, Ian, thank you for your contribution. Would you go back on Pac-Man? He's making a few mistakes that you'd sort out in seconds. I'll rewatch and draw up a list. I'm up for the anti-MS vaccine. I don't know how you get it to myelin. You don't have to get it to myelin. You get it in the serum where the antibodies are first circulating before they get in there. Um, I'm not going to go back up right now because we're almost out of time. And um, I want to finish up this poll here. Did anyone... All right, I'm going to do... I'm going to count. I'm going to count yeses. Let's see where they start. This is not very hard. Uh, we'll take off Ian here. So... Uh, count up the yeses. Oh, someone wrote me. I don't know what that means. <laughs> we'll count it as a yes. One, two. Mm. Another Venmo. Thank you. Let's see who's who gave us a Venmo. Uh, that was Peter before. We have to refresh. Hot breakfast. Thank you so much for your contribution to science communication. So how many yeses did we have? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, uh, eight. And some people are doing their friends. We just wanted to hear from you. Eight, um, nine. Mm-hmm. So I don't know how many people uh, responded, but a nine, only nine out of 200, which is 5%, right? Roughly. Thank you, Doreen, for your contribution to science communication. We hope you enjoyed our banter tonight. Yeah, Patricia said, I'm counting eight or nine uh, or 10. It's about 5%. Yeah, Patricia, you and I are good at the math, aren't we? <laughs> we got the same number. Um, yeah, the five percent. Does that sound about right? I don't know. Here's Richard. Hello, Richard. Good to see you again. Haven't seen you in ages. Question: What is the proper term for the variety of T cells made in response? To infection, I recall that the response in the germinal center produces hundreds of versions. What's the name for the variety? Hmm. Probably an immunologist could answer that. You know, it's it's all about T cell receptor diversity. Yeah, it can produce hundreds of versions. Well, they're, they're all based on diverse T-cell receptors, right? Um, I don't know. I don't know what you're getting at. Does anyone know what Richard is thinking about? 
the variety of T cells made in response to infection. And, you know, our, our immune podcast last week, they would have gotten that. Hmm. No, no. Sorry, Richard. You can tell I'm not an immunologist, right? Right. <laughs> Variety of T cells. Did anyone else answer it? Let's look down at the stream here. <laughs> ah. Variety of T cells. Well, we're gonna we're gonna sc scroll down and we'll see what happens here. Have I gotten the rabies vaccine? No, I have not. I don't, I'm not at risk. I don't know if you're asking me, but you, you do say microbe TV. Um, you know, I don't work with animals, so. Well, you can get rabies vaccine if you're at risk. If you're a veterinarian or work with wildlife, you can get a rabies vaccine, yeah. So there are two indications. Thank you, Sarah, for your contribution to science communication. Really appreciate it. And yes... To get technical, never having it means never having had symptomatic disease. So, yes, that's why I said you were sure because you don't have any symptoms. But you may have been asymptomatically infected, which would have been um, – you, you could know if you could do an antibody test, right? Oh, Dr. Susan Oliver. Oh, she was on the stream one night, remember? And I totally dropped her. Oh, my God. I just need an assistant to help me with stuff. Oh, my God. I have so many. Yeah, Susan Oliver was on the stream. I emailed her, and I said, can we get you on? Although the stream, she can't be on. No, the, the, the she said she, the timing was wrong. But let me write it down. We can get her on TWIV. But you guys may remember, she was on the stream a couple of weeks ago, and she said the timing for the stream isn't good, but uh, some other timing would work. So, yeah. <laughs> Boy, I tell you, get my memory jogged here for sure. Uh, and there you go, Bambi says, wildlife scientists, wildlife handlers, hunters are advised for rabies vaccine. I thought you were going to say rabies, but that would be for rabies too. Yep. Let's see, what else do we have here? Anybody? Uh, um, oh, anything about Richard's T-cell questions, T-cell diversity, right? Gee, it's very difficult to teach scientific uncertainty. That's true. That's part of the problem with, with the COVID vaccine, right? You can never say never, never going to happen, Right. And people don't like that. They say, oh, you're just, um, you're just not certain about anything, are you? The lawyers love to take advantage of that. Hmm. <laughs> I've seen the latest Paul Offit segment on how the anti-vax movement is more dangerous than previously recognized. I don't know about Jonestown. Sorry. Hello, Sylvia. Hey, Bogota, Bogota Colombian. Good. Welcome. Welcome. All right. We are four minutes out. Let's see what else we have here. Thank you, AZ for your contribution to science communication. Oh, we're, these things are bouncing around now, but uh, <laughs> I just saw an email. Here we go. From, uh, where is it? Oh, come on. It's from the lady who lost her smell because... She worked on pigs. Well, I don't know if that's the reason, but <laughs> do we know the number of asymptomatic COVID infections? 
Well, yeah, we do. And we did a paper on them on TWIV, which shows that a good proportion of them have a certain HLA type, which allows them to present a conserved T-cell peptide that is identical to a peptide from a common cold coronavirus. So they get protection against symptomatic disease from previous infection with a common cold coronavirus, but only people with a certain HLA type. And that explains a portion, a 20% or so, of the asymptomatic infection. So yes, people want to know why that's happening. Another reason is they have a really good interferon response as well. All right, so that is on the way. Where can I find the rule that permits a doctor to prescribe Paxlovid before travel? Well, we've been talking about it on um, on Daniel's clinical update. We had a letter last week from a guy, and Daniel has talked about it. Um, I mean, basically, it's an off-label. It's an off-label prescription because it is. Um, <clears throat> I'm sorry, it's not off-label actually because it's the treat. It's the treat um, COVID, so it's not really off-label. Um, but if, if you were, I, I don't remember what Daniel said. You have to go back to the last one or the one before, and he talks about that. But he, he, he calls it off-label, but it's not really off-label, right? It's, it's the same disease, it's just for different application. All right, where is that <laughs> email from the lady without the smell? Because I, I wanted to address it. it. was a good question, and it's gone. It just popped out of the way. Oh, well. I guess I could search for it, but um, Jill. Is it Jill? Yeah, Jill had the uh, loss of smell. So here we go. Loss of smell. Ammonia can cause loss of smell, right? And then you ask something later. Hmm. Wow, there's a lot of messages I missed. We need a fun name for us, Rack and Elephant. You don't want viral files? That doesn't work? <laughs> okay. Oh, but now I went all the way to the top of the chat. I'm sorry, it's 10 o'clock and I'm still f fumbling here, folks. Sorry, I was looking for something. But let's see if there are any other contributions that I should be addressing here. All right, so that's Susan Oliver. There you go. Back to the science, right? <laughs> hey, somebody hit the like and we'll hit 200. Only one more. Richard, thank you so much. Oh, thank you. I appreciate it. And it's good to have you back. I appreciate your support for science communication. And I think uh, we've got the lighting doing well at the incubator, if you've noticed it lately. It's nice and, and warm here, of course. But at the incubator, we have a nice lighting setup if you ever want to check it out. Thank you, Richard. All right. Thanks, everybody, for coming by tonight. You made me feel good because I do... Uh, often worry that anyone's going to show up and that uh, we're going to have a good time. But we always have a good time, don't we? 207 likes. Thank you so much. You guys are great. I want to thank our mods for tonight. Uh, we had Steph. We had uh, Tom. We had Les. We had Andrew. We had Frank. Did I get everybody? I think so. Vanity Nutrition. Thank you all for moderating tonight. And thanks all of you. We had over 200 people for coming tonight. Really love having you here. You, you're a great crowd. You make me feel that I'm useful. Next week is going to be the 27th of September, the Wednesday, 8 p.m. We'll, we'll be back. Oh, Environmental, you did a super chat. Let me find it. There it is. I'm sorry. Sorry to miss it. Thank you, Environmental, for your con contribution to science communication. It's always a comfort to be here listening and learning, feeling better. Thank you, Vincent. I'm sorry I missed it. You know, I'm kind of fumbling around here at the end. 
trying to find people. We had uh, that one. Let me scroll up and see if I missed. Yeah, I missed you. I don't know why, but we got it. Um, and thanks, everyone, for your support tonight. We really appreciate that. We'll be back in a week. Maybe we'll have a, a guest. Uh, we don't know yet. We'll, we'll work on it. Um, and again, if you're in New York City, um, come by. Come by the incubator and uh, say hello. We'll give you a little tour. Take a picture in the seat that I sit at. And um, in the meantime, folks, be safe. Have a good week. And uh, thanks for coming. Good night, everybody.